second verse is redeemed and so happy in Jesus. Here we go. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus. No language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Step up here if you will. I would like for you to have prayer with us tonight. We're glad you're here. What a great crowd for this Wednesday night. Uh, in the morning about, well, I'm not sure of the time, but uh, Brother Dallas Kirby's nephew, his name is Hendrick, and they were going to do it today, but now they're doing it tomorrow. Uh, little, he's a little guy, little, little guy. And so they're doing a pretty two or three hour surgery on stomach and intestines and all that kind of stuff. So pray for him. And then we got some really, we received some really good news about Courtney a little while ago. They reduced the oxygen to about, I think they said 15%. She's eating, and if she continues to eat, uh, they'll take the feeding tube out tonight, which is great. But then I did hear they may have to keep her another week. Don't quote me on that, but uh, a lot of progress being made. So thank God for answering prayer, and she's sitting up in a chair. And they turned the, 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 the main, main, you know, like all that oxygen, they turned it way down. So that means she's breathing on her own. But continue to pray for her. Uh, Brother Good is not here. He was not here Sunday. I want to pray for Brother Good tonight. Brother Chuck Willis has been at home for about two weeks. I want to pray for him. And then Brother Nathan's, uh, Brother Nathan's wife, Ashley, fell sick. Uh, oh, there's Chuck Willis. Okay, God bless you. Glad you're here. Glad you're here. But uh, his wife got sick in Kentucky, and she's still sick and had to come home from school today. So pray for her, okay? Brother Andy, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, maybe you've got a request by show of hand. You've got a request by show, yes, ma'am. Uh, probably your brother, your brother at the point of death. That's just the truth of it, right? At the point of death in hospice care. Miss Sheila's brother Pete is his name. Pray for him. Or somebody else got a request? Yes, sir, right here. Oh, my. Lord. God bless. God. Pray for that family. Right, somebody else got an object? Yes, ma'am, right here in the middle. Yes, ma'am. Didn't, what, what, I didn't hear what, what happened to her? My goodness. I'm sorry. Mm. Yes, I'm sure. All right, we're former pastor's family. Somebody else? Somebody else? Uh, yes, ma'am, right here. Sorry. That's her old Miss Sandy Thompson's oldest son. Somebody else? Yes, ma'am. Brother Randy, Pastor Randy Phillips, all right? Still going through chemo and all that other stuff because of the cancer. Somebody else? Somebody else? Feel free to share. Good to see Preacher Jones with us tonight. All right, Brother Spencer, I don't expect you to remember all of these, but let's pray God to have his way in this service. And in these that are uh, afflicted tonight, Brother Randy, please. Lord, we just thank you tonight, in, here in the middle of the week, that we can turn aside from the cares of life and the affairs of the world, Lord, and get our mind on you. And Amen. we are, as we just sang, thankful to be redeemed, yes. thankful to be saved forever, Lord. Thankful for your marvelous grace, for your great love for us, Lord. You come into this world full of sin, a world that rejected you. Called us, drew, you by, drew us by your marvelous grace, and we just thank you for that. 
God, we just thank you for salvation. It's sure good to be saved, be part of your family. Yeah. Lord, we do pray for all these prayer requests oh, tonight that have just been made. Lord, for every one of these situations, God, we realize none of them have caught you by surprise. Lord, we pray that you'd meet every one of these needs according to your precious will. Yeah, thank you for what you've yeah. already done for Courtney. Thank you, Lord, that we look back and see Brother Chuck back with us yeah, tonight. Please. God, we pray that you continue to help little Hendrick. Thank you for where you've brought him from, yeah. Lord, already. God, we pray for Brother Dennis and for all these others that's been mentioned tonight, Lord. God, we pray for each one of them, Lord, that, uh, that you just be with them, that you'd meet these needs according to your precious will, Father, that you'd help them. And then, Father, we pray that you'd meet with us here tonight, Lord. We come, Lord, because we have a longing to meet with you and fellowship with you and be with the saints of God. And, Lord, just fellowship around the Word of God tonight. God, we pray that you fill our passion with the Holy Ghost. Blessing the meeting, Lord, as the words preach. We pray, Holy Ghost of God, that you'd move up and down these aisles and these pews and yes. touch hearts and help us, Lord, and strengthen us and draw us closer to you. Help us to be more yielded, more surrendered to thee, Father, that, Lord, that we might be a brighter light in a dark and dying world. Lord, we just thank you again for this privilege. Pray that you bless, that you get glory and honor to your name. And everything we say and do, we'll praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Page 350. Tis so sweet. Trust in me. Brother Derek and Miss Malia are going to get one ready for us in just a moment. But I've got several things that I need to bring to everybody's attention. So we're not going to let you shake hands tonight. We can do that later. But uh, I need your undivided attention. We try to give all this all right. We're glad you're here. Great, great crowd. I talked to a preacher uh, today uh, in another city. And it might have been even another state. And told me, he said, Preacher, we hope that we'll have 25 or 30 tonight. And, and I said, that's okay, that's okay, that's wonderful, that's great. And a lot of churches are in that kind of shape. And that God's just surely been good to us here. He really has. And we do not need to take it for granted, all right? But anyway, if you're interested, here's the 10th annual after Thanksgiving Jubilee, Pilgrim's Way Baptist Church, Rutherford, North Carolina. Uh, Pastor Chad Watson, Chris Curtis Ponder, Davy Shelton, Jeff Ledbetter, Stephen Aldridge, Ken Bowman, Travis Parker, Alan Kirk, other preachers call from the floor, the AG family singing, and so this is starting at 7 p.m., okay, the next two nights, all right? You can get this flyer if you'd like to go, then uh, I know they'd be glad to have you. The uh, junior class uh, is a, has a fundraiser this Friday, December 3rd at 6 p.m. in the school cafeteria. Tickets can be purchased at the door the night of. The cost per ticket will be $3 for students, 5 for adults. Kids three and under will be free. Concessions will be provided. And they're going to do a Christmas-themed movie night so you know it'll be clean. And so this is for the junior class. If you'd like to do something Friday night, hot dogs, popcorn, candy, Christmas cookies, hot chocolate, sweet tea, coffee, water, and the juniors hope to see you there, all right? Keep that in mind, okay? And then, uh, man, I got a lot of stuff up here. All the literature's in the Sunday school rooms, okay? If you need to get your quarterly or your teacher's quarterly, that's in the rooms. And then uh, this uh, Saturday night, uh, there's a youth Christmas party. Everybody's invited. What's the ages, Brother Nathan? 12 and up. All right, 12 and up. It starts at 5.30. That's the Christmas party. 
And uh, so uh, even if Ashley's sick, they're going ahead with it, and they'll get some help. So uh, all the youth of the church, all of you, you're invited this Saturday at 5.30 in the fellowship hall, okay? All right, let me finish up here. The youth choir is singing December the 11th. That's next week, I believe, at White Plains Baptist Church. We need to keep that in mind. Please, youth choir singing December the 11th, okay? Keep that in mind. Now, uh, Miss Jenna Dover has been diligently getting addresses ready. A lot of you are doing your Christmas cards and all that for the church, and we've compiled. We haven't did a directory because we knew this would happen. See, like, if we did one, it would have been outdated because new people just joined again. So, uh, but we've got, we've got a list that goes back to about 19, and all the newer families and newer addresses, it's about three pages. If you like this, we're going to do a new one right about the middle of January. We're going to shoot for the middle of January to get everybody on a brand new church directory. But in the meantime, if you're doing your Christmas card and you'd like all the new folks who's joined since about 19, all those, even the ones recently, the addresses should be here. And if we left anybody out, see Jenna Dover, all right? You stay here as long as you can after church, all right? So they can see you. If anybody got left out, we'll, we'll talk to her. But we got copies of this down front, and if you'll keep that in mind. Lastly, while they come on, y'all, you ready? Okay, y'all get ready. Uh, lastly, uh, we did this last year, or uh, the church did, or somebody did, but Tabernacle Children's Home is always a, a good Christmas project. I mean, it's always a good Christmas project. Uh, the pastor's brother, Joel Logan, great people over there, great people. I think last year we took a bunch of groceries. I know we did. Took a bunch of groceries. Well, this year, uh, the, the young couple Sunday school class is going to be taking up special monies, I think, for the next two weeks. Next two weeks. And so, uh, sir? This coming Sunday. So if anybody else in this church would like to contribute to the Tabernacle Children's Home for a Christmas love offering, Christmas uh, blessing, Christmas uh, giving. And by the way, Christmas is about giving. Amen. So if you'd like to contribute, give it to Brother Randy or Miss Pam. I promise you can trust you with the money, and we'll get one big offering and get it to the Tabernacle Children's Home. And I, I know they do, all right? All right, that's enough announcements, and you've got all this information, and we're anxious to preach in just a minute. But right now we have a song, all right? God bless you. Oh, how wonderful is my 
shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Is my Savior's love for me. Thank you. That's loud. All right, but it's okay. <laughs> You're going to have to turn it down a little bit. I never say that, but anyway, the first time for everything. Amen. Take your Bibles, everybody, and go to 1 John chapter number 1. You're about to blow their ears off, Brother Philip. <laughs> or I'm hearing myself real loud. It's okay. 1 John chapter 1. Wow, what's happening? <laughs> Sir? I'm going to Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll get it figured out. Appreciate um, Yeah, man. I feel like I'm preaching all the way to, 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 to Mississippi. Appreciate uh, No, man, I tell you, no, that ain't right. Come on, kill him. Appreciate the, um, the labor of love that uh, took place about all afternoon for the delicious food and the meal that uh, most of us enjoy. Thank you so much for everybody that participated and had part in providing that delicious meal for all of us. First John chapter number one. Now, before, before I preach, I, I, and I'm not gonna be long, I know you wanna go home, all that kind of stuff, but, uh, John is, is combating error. John is contradicting false teachers. False, now listen, false doctrine. And, and, and here's who it's coming from, and, and I'm not trying to impress you with this word, but I want you to know what, what's happening. There was a sect, S-E-C-T, sect, a group. They were called the Gnostics. Very, very knowledgeable, so they thought. Very learned, um, professing great insight into spiritual realities and knowledge of the Word of God. Their, their, um, their error was them being preoccupied with deliverance from the flesh. Stay with me, okay? Their error was that, Brother David, they thought they could get to the place where they were uh, completely delivered from the flesh and the power of sin. And could I tell you this? That is a flat out lie. Right, right. You're right. If anybody in this building believes that, then uh, we got an altar down here for you right now. Because yeah. as long as we're on this side of eternity, yeah. there is not going to be absolute, complete deliverance from our flesh. Right, right. We're always going to battle it, amen or not. Right. Now, in, in combating this error, in... Uh, in setting, uh, setting the doctrine on a sure foundation, he uses a formula, and he does it three times. Very, uh, very wise writing. Uh, by the way, we know that comes from the Holy Spirit. And we haven't said this in a while, but our Bible is inspired of God. Words inspired, I'm not trying to impress you with that word either. It means God breathed. Yes, the words you got in your lap are the very words of God himself. Yes, and I'm glad I have a copy of it. Yes, so in this, in this great defense, this great stand for doctrinal truth, remember he's combating 
these learned Gnostics. And Brother Wofford, here's what they assumed was right. Look at verse number 5. Chapter 1, verse 5. I'm going to work my way into this. I love this stuff. Chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now, here's the first formula. If we say, now, believe it or not, Paul, in this particular chapter, Brother Derek, is identifying with them, but that doesn't mean he was of them. What he's saying, Miss Jimenez, is that if it were I or anybody else, it don't matter who they are, but if this is what they say, then I want you to know this is not true. Watch what he says, all right? Verse number six, if we say, and by the way, by the way, there was a group of people saying this. There was a group of people teaching this. False doctrine trying to pervade the local churches and corrupt the true doctrine of God. Here's what they said. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, John said, we lie and do not the truth. In other words, you can't say that you're in fellowship with God if you're walking in darkness. John is so straight here, so dog. Somebody said, a preacher shouldn't be dogmatic. Well, I beg to differ with you. John's very dogmatic. Now, I'm going to say the words of John. If we say that we have fellowship with God, but we walk in darkness, you know what we are? We lie. You say, well, how do we lie? Because your life is not supporting what your lips are saying. That is a contradiction, and that is a lie. Amen or not? Verse number, oh, by the way, verse 6, and we do not the truth. Now he gives a, the contradiction to it. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And all God's people ought to say hallelujah. In other words, Brother Jones, we don't have to walk in darkness. We don't have to walk in defilement. We don't have to walk in unconfessed sin. Thank God there's a remedy. Thank God there's an answer. Thank God there's a provision. And that provision, ladies and gentlemen, is the blood of Jesus Christ continually being pled before the mercy seat on high. And he is our advocate. He's our intercessor. He's our mediator. And if I will, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Well, here's what I want to say. Don't, don't be like these people that were saying this. Don't be like that. There's a lot of people, well, a few, that claim to be in fellowship with God. They claim to be in communion with the Lord, but their life is filled with sin and darkness. Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks. That's a lie. Those people are not telling the truth. And it may not be verbally. It may be with their life. Now, that's the first one, if we say. Let, let, me, uh, let me tell you, let me break it down for you, all right? They, they are denying in, this, in that particular verse, they are denying the seriousness of sin. And Paul indicates with a correction. And the correction is that don't deny the seriousness of sin because sin will break fellowship with God. Could I get an amen? Sin will break fellowship with God. But they were saying... They were saying, Miss Sheila, that you could be in fellowship with God and at the same time walk in darkness. Brother Randy, they were denying the seriousness of sin. 
Look at, look at verse number 8. Here's the second formula. Look at verse number 8. If we say, so apparently, Brother Jones, there was a crowd saying it. If we say that we have no sin, now this is your nature. This is your fallen nature, and this is where this crowd really was, Miss Jackie. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Remember what I told you by way of introduction. They were enamored. They were caught up. They were, they were, they were propagating, amen. They were propagating that you could reach a place of deliverance from your flesh. But I tell you what, if we could reach a place of deliverance from our flesh, I'd be the first one in line. I said I'd be the first one in line. I don't care if it's what state it was. I don't care what preacher's offering it. I don't care who's preaching it. If it's true, Brother Johnny, if it's true, sign me up. Amen. I said sign me up. But the truth is that uh, you can't say that, and I can't say that, and your grandmother can't say that, and your grandfather can't say that, that we have not, that we have no sin. That's referring not to particular deeds. That is the fallen nature. That is the fleshly nature. That is the Adamic nature. And if I read my Bible correctly, that all men are born sinners. And we have inherited a fallen nature. I'm not getting no help up here. I said we have inherited a fallen nature. I don't care how you want to whitewash it, what you want to call it, what you want to renegotiate it, what you might even be saying. If you stand up here or testify or tell your family and uh, you have no sin and you deceive yourself and the truth is probably not in you. Amen. They in this second formula are denying human sinfulness. And so Paul states the corrective and he says that sin does exist in our nature. It does exist in our nature and as a matter of fact we all have a fallen nature. Amen. We all, you say, well, um, oh, let, let me quote a verse if I can get it right. Yeah, help me, Lord. Psalm 51. Help me. with. If I mess it up, y'all help me. I think it's Psalm 51. Yeah, yeah. Verse 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. We are born with a sinful nature. Nothing, every little baby in this building, every little infant in this sanctuary, Miss Amber, every child at Mountain View Christian Academy and every child in everybody's home, you may think they're angels. Or you may think they're the greatest thing that ever was since sliced bread. But I want to tell you something, that sweet, darling little child that you have, that you love with all of your heart, that child has a fallen nature. Hey, hey, let me get it more plainer than that. That child has the nature of sin on the inside of them. And now listen, listen, they're not going to reach the age. They're not going to reach the age where they, uh, where they finally or gradually come in to the reality of a sin nature. No, no, no. They are born that way. They're born that way. Could I get a double Amen. So there apparently, Miss Malia, apparently somebody was saying the wrong thing. Somebody was saying some stuff that didn't measure up with true doctrine. Here's what it said. Let's read verse 8 again. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Did you know the worst deception is self-deception? The worst deception is self-deception. And could you imagine, let's just slow down a minute. I, I want you to get this tonight. Could you imagine, Brother Galloway, somebody being so deceived with their own life that they would even say or even hint at or even suggest that they don't have a sin nature. Oh. Buddy, that's deception. Yeah. Now, I'm going to tell you something else. That's not only self-deception, I believe it's satanic deception. You say, well, what's the big deal? Because if you grow up all your life 
and you say you have no sin, then look at me, look at me. If you say you have no sin, guess what? You'll never need a Savior. So you know what it is? It's a trick of the devil to take people to a devil's hell. And that's what he wants to do, to get people to grow up. Uh, Miss Crystal, believing that, 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 you know, it's like, it's like, and, and I just, man, there's so many things going through my mind. It's like, you know, they interview people or they get their testimony and they say things like, well, I've always been a Christian or I was born a Christian. No, you were not born a Christian. You were born a sinner. You've always been a sinner. Well, I can't really remember a time. I just, I've just always known the Lord. Nope, 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 nope. No, you have not always known the Lord. That's not true. If you hear it on TV, if you hear it on the radio, if you hear it out of this pulpit, hey, it's not true. It's not true. And I'm just going to tell you all something. I get really leery of people that start talking that way. Well, I don't remember calling on him. And I'm not trying to make anybody doubt. I don't remember an experience. I don't remember professing him. I don't remember accepting him. I don't remember repenting. I don't remember realizing that I truly was a sinner. I, I just grew up in America. And so I just figured since I grew up in America, and America's a Christian nation, that's a, that's a no good, uh, then I must be a Christian. Nope, nope. You born in America, you're born a sinner. Can you imagine that there was a group of people that was trying to pervade the local assembly and teach that they could get to the place of eradication or not even eradication, but elimination of a sin nature. But, Paul, but John said, John said, time out. Time out. Y'all go stand in the corner. Let me tell you the truth. He says it three times. Verse, let's read verse 8 again. If we say that we have no sin, I believe that's the fallen nature, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Look at verse 9. Look at verse 9. If we, I love this. God, I love this. I hope you'll love this. If, if we, and John does include himself, if we confess our sins, plural, that's daily deeds. The first, if we say, has to do with fellowship. The second, if we say, has to do with a fallen nature. And the third, if we say, has to do with our own failures and sin. You see the outline? Our own failures and sin. Let's read verse 9 again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful, hallelujah for that, and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from how much of it? Somebody holler that. All. Oh. All. Oh. So what's that mean in the Greek? All. Oh. All, oh, preacher, all. Oh. Unrighteous. Now, here, now here's, what, here's what, Brother Jones, here's what was so, so, so messed up. Even back then, look what was happening. Now we have the third formula in verse number 10. If we say... Paul gave the answer in verse 9, but then the contradiction from them in verse number 10. If we say, so apparently, Brother Caden, some folks were saying it, that we have not sinned. And I believe that refers to acts of sin. I believe, Brother Brian, that verse 8 refers to the fallen nature. Help me with this, okay? This is kind of hard stuff to, to navigate. I believe, Brother Officer, verse 8 is the fallen nature, but verse 10 is the actual commission of deeds or faults or failures or wrongdoing. It makes sense to me anyway. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. i tell you one thing. I don't want to make him a liar. Watch this. And his word is not in us. Do you understand now what I'm saying? This crowd that was professing this false doctrine Hope, John, good to see you. I didn't even see you too just now, Josh. Hope to get to the place where they would be delivered, delivered completely from the fallen nature. But John said, you're, you're liars. You're deceiving yourself. Look at verse number 10. You're making God a liar. Man, what a crime that is. You're making, 
Making God, how, how's that making God a liar? Because God knows whether or not we've sinned. Are you listening? If we say, and by the way, just, just to whet your appetite, and I'm not going to preach it right now, Brother Jackson, but just to whet your appetite, he picks up with the same theme in chapter 2. Look at verse number 4, chapter 2, verse 4. He that saith, look at verse 6, he that saith, look at verse 9, Brother Brian, he, he that saith. In other words, there was a whole lot of talking going on. There was a whole lot of saying going on, but it didn't line up with Scripture. It was a contradiction. And, and I'm not going to preach, though. So I may do it some other time, but not tonight. So in verse number, if you're, if you're taking notes, in verses 6 and 7, listen, to, I'm going to give it to you in, summer, in summation. In verse 6 and 7, Brother Emery, it's so good to see you, Brother Ray. But in verse 6 and 7, they were denying the seriousness of sin. And Paul said, you can't deny the seriousness of sin because sin breaks fellowship. In verse 8 and 9, they were denying human sinfulness. Human sinfulness. And Paul says that you can't, you can't deny human sinfulness because, because sin, sin exists in our nature. Sin exists in our nature. The first one affects our fellowship. The second one affects the fact that we have a fallen nature. Could I get an amen? And it's the truth. And then the third one, they deny not only the seriousness of sin, they were denying the human sinfulness. But now, Brother David, uh, what, what, what arrogance? What, what, what getting off at the wrong track? They were denying having committed, yep. having committed any sinful deeds. But uh, throughout these verses, he says that, you know, Sinful deeds show themselves in our conduct and in our failures. Folks, let me tell you something. And I want you to listen to me, and I want you to, I want you to agree with it. We all sin. We all sin. Right or wrong. And I'm going to go a step further. I'm putting myself on a limb right here. But it may be accurate. It just may be accurate. We probably all sin every day. Every day. So I ain't done nothing wrong. I didn't say you did anything wrong. What about the things you neglected? What about the sins of omission? Hello? What about the sins of What about when the Holy Spirit prompted you to witness you didn't do it? That's sin. What about when the Holy Spirit prompted you to testify and you sat there? That's sin. You grieve the Holy Spirit. The truth is this. We all sin. We all sin. We sin because we have a human nature. That human nature will never be eradicated. That human nature will never be killed. Hold on. That human nature will never get to the place that human nature will never get to the place that you have absolute deliverance from your flesh. It, you'll never get there. You'll ne By the way, we should strive for that, but you'll never get there. Here's what I want to say tonight, though, in spite of all of it. In spite of all of it, Brother John Cudd, I appreciate verse 9. I appreciate verse 9. You ought to appreciate verse 9. If we confess our sins, confess, what does that mean? To agree with God about it. Stop making excuses. Stop comparing yourself. Stop saying stupid stuff like everybody else is doing it. It don't matter if everybody else is doing it. If it's sin, it's sin. And by the way, I'll tell you this. If it was sin in your life a year ago, it's probably still a sin in your life tonight. I'm so tired of people making excuses. Don't do like these false teachers. Don't follow that train of, of, of false teaching that you say this and you say that. And by the way, please don't say that you're in fellowship with God if you're walking in darkness. Does you understand that's a contradiction? Do you understand that one negates the other, right? One negates the other. 
Do you understand that can't happen? It got a little quiet. You cannot be in fellowship with God and walk in unconfessed sin. You can't. You can't. All that's talked about. Brother Trey, I don't know how many times through my life, through since I was 16, and I hope you don't fault me for this, but Brother Kevin, I don't know how many times I've started prayer with this right here. Lord, you said if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I'm so glad, thank God, he is faithful and he is just. And I'm so glad he forgives. Hey, aren't you glad you don't have to let sin stay in you? I said, aren't you glad there's a provision? Aren't you glad, thank God, this is shouting glad? Aren't you glad there's a remedy? Aren't you glad God has an answer? And by the way, the answer is found in verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And what is it, preacher? And the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You know what's going on at the right hand of the Father? The advocate is pleading his blood. The advocate is presenting his blood. The advocate is saying, Father, I've said, by the way, all your sins were future. All your sins were future. And thank God for an advocate. Thank God for a go-between. Thank God for a lawyer. Let me drop Proverbs 28, 13 on you. He that covereth the sin shall not prosper, but whoso confess it and forsaketh it shall have mercy. The best thing you can ever do, the greatest thing you can ever do, the most spiritual thing that you can ever do is to confess and forsake your sin. Confess and forsake it. All that's in this chapter. That's the remedy. That's the answer. The answer, and I'm going to give it to you again. The answer is not for us to deny the seriousness of sin. It's not for us to deny human sinfulness. That's verse 8 and 9. And it's not for us to deny that we have committed daily deeds of wrong or sin. I'm so glad I don't have to stay dirty. So glad I don't have to stay, stay in the mud, the, the, mud, the mud pit. So glad God can forgive. God can cleanse. God can restore. And God can bless. If you're taking notes, verse 6 has to do with your fellowship. Verse 8 has to do with your fallen nature. And verse 10 has to do with your failures. Write those down. It's important. Your fellowship, your fallen nature, and your failures. Now, I'm glad there's an answer, and I'm finished almost, but I want to ask you a question. Because, I mean, I've got, you see what I have. All night, all night worth of preaching. Now, I have a question for you. I've never dealt with this. But do you know the difference? Do you know the difference between Holy Spirit conviction and satanic accusation? This is all dealing with my subject. Do you know the difference between Holy Spirit conviction and satanic accusation? You will never have peace. You will never have victory. Everybody, give me five minutes. Give me five minutes, okay? Five minutes. You'll never have peace. You'll never have victory until you learn to differentiate between Holy Ghost conviction of sin and satanic accusation. So explain that, preacher. This is big right here. This is really big. Really, really. This is really big. Really big. <laughs> I can't do it. You know, you know I'm imitating. It's really big. <laughs> Thank God for our president. <laughs> if you ain't God by now, you ain't never going to get it. 
Listen to this. If this don't help you in your walk with God, then I don't know what else to say to you. The Holy Spirit will never convict you of a sin that he has already cleansed. Let it sink in like a spring rain. The Holy Spirit will never convict you of a sin that he has already cleansed. Stay with me. God will never accuse you of any sin that he has already placed under the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. God would not be just if those cleansed sins were brought back before you. I said, God would not be just if those cleansed, forsaken, repented of sin were brought back before you. Why would God do, the, do you that way? Why would God do that? All right, you sin. I sin. We don't stay with it. We don't keep it. We don't, hey, watch this. We don't go on in it. What do we do? What do we do? We confess and we forsake. We turn, repent, and we leave it alone. Say amen. That's what we're supposed to do. All right, can I ask you a question? If you confess, agreed with God about it, if you forsook it, if you got it under the blood, 1 John 1, 7, then I'm asking you a question. Why would God keep bringing it up? Why would God require double jeopardy of you? So guess what? That's not God. I'm helping somebody. That's not God. That's satanic accusation to beat you down, to defeat you, to hinder you, to hurt you, to rob you of your joy, to rob you of victory. Here's what I'm telling you tonight. There is a difference. I'm telling you now, there is a difference between Holy Spirit conviction and satanic accusation. And you need to learn to differentiate between the two. I believe the Holy Spirit will convict you quickly. I believe the Holy Spirit will convict you personally. I believe the Holy Spirit will convict you uh, informatively. What do you mean? He'll let you know, hey, that's sin. And thank God, Miss, Miss, Miss Christian, when he does, we say, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I want that out of my mind. I want that out of my life. I, I don't want to do that ever again. I want, to, I want that under the blood. Lord, I, I confess it. I forsake it. I leave it alone. And guess what? God forgives. How much? And y'all help me right here. How much does God forgive of? All. All unrighteousness. All sin. Then why do you spend the next uh, three months telling God that you, want you, that you want him to forgive you again? He already forgave you the first time. Stay with me, okay? I want to help you. He already forgave you the first time because he brought Holy Ghost conviction. So what do you think it is, Brother Nathan, that bombards our minds, that torments our soul, that weighs heavy on our spirit? That's not Holy Ghost conviction. It's already under the blood. Am I preaching the truth? It's already under the blood. And by the way, the only way to get under the blood is confess and forsake. Confess and forsake. You get it under the blood. So then you just keep on and you keep on and you keep on and you keep on. And every time you start your prayer, you tell God you're sorry. And every time you come to church, you tell God you're sorry. And every, every day of your life, you're still confessing the same sin. Why? This isn't Catholicism, friend. This isn't Catholicism. Why do we feel like we have to confess the same sin over and over and over when God said, I'll forgive you if you confess and forsake? I'm going to tell you what's going on. It's not Holy Ghost conviction. Brother Jones, I believe it's satanic accusation. Right, you say, well, do you have any scripture for that? Well, you know the, you know the Bible. You know what the Bible says about the, the enemy of our soul. He's called what? Y'all help me. What, what's he called? The, somebody just said it. The what? The accuser of the brethren. The brethren. He loves to accuse you. He loves to beat you down. He loves to remind you what you did. He loves to bring it back up. 
He loves to make you feel bad about it. He loves to hurt you spiritually, mentally, emotionally, by, and wound. he loves to wound you by bringing it back up over and over and over. Hey, hey, that's not Holy Ghost conviction. If you'll remember when the Holy Ghost conviction came, you confessed and you forsook it. So then what is it? It's satanic accusation. If you have confessed your sins to Jesus, I'm almost finished. If you have confessed your sins to Jesus and forsake, forsaken and, and you've forsaken those sins, yet they keep coming back to mind, it is the devil that is accusing you and it is not the Holy Spirit. When God cleanses us of sin, he forgets it. He said, I will forgive their sin. We'll remember their iniquity no more. The Bible said that he's cast our sins behind our back. As far as the east is from the west, he's removed our transgression. Are you listening? You need to differentiate between Holy Ghost conviction and satanic accusation. You will never become the victorious Christian that God wants you to be until you know how God convicts of sin. How does he convict of sin? I believe he does it immediately. I believe he does it personally. I believe he doesn't wait five months. He doesn't wait three years. He doesn't wait one year. I believe in the child of God's life that's wanting to do right, you sin, Holy Ghost convicts you. Holy Ghost gives you all kinds of uneasiness. And thank God we can get right. Thank God we can get right. A month later, a month later, a month later, he's beat you down with it over and over. And here, you know, watch me. And you start confessing it. You just did that a month ago. Did he or did he not forgive you a month ago? Is he calling double jeopardy on you? What, what are you doing? What are you doing? Did he forgive you a month ago or did he not? He did. He did. So guess what's going on? The devil's hot on your trail. Trying to beat you down. Trying to remind you. The Holy Spirit, here I'm finished. The Holy Spirit convicts us. The devil accuses us. The Holy Spirit convicts us. The devil accuses us. Learn to differentiate and you'll be victorious in your walk with God. Listen, you have 1 John 1, 7. You have 1 John 1, 9. You have Proverbs 28, 13. You've got 1 John. What about chapter 2? I didn't even preach it. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. Yet if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the, the, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. This, this chapter is just full of God's remedy. God's remedy. Now, let's bow our head. Let's close our eyes. Let's come to the instrument. Please, I want us to come to the instrument. Instruments, please. Thank you for listening, everybody. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We're not going to ask for a show of hands, but I am going to ask you tonight, as you survey your heart and mind, as, as you sit in this beautiful sanctuary on this beautiful Wednesday night, a great crowd in church, as you sit among your fellow believers, do you have any unconfessed sin in you? If you do, if you do, you let the Holy Spirit speak to you right now. You confess it, you forsake it, and you leave it alone. You get away from it. You get it out of your heart, you get it out of your mind, and you go forward. Heavenly Father, help every one of us, Lord. Thank you for the remedy. We sure we don't want to be like those Gnostics. They denied everything. And we know that we're not going to ever reach the place where, where we are delivered from the flesh. We know that. We're not even thinking about that. God, let us be victorious Christians, please. Let our men, our women, our teenagers, our college and career, even our young people, Lord, let us be victorious Christians in this matter of confessing and forsaken sin. Stay away from it. Keep it out of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing that verse. Ready?